welcome to Art with Mrs. Cap this week. This week we are going to be diving into the Mughal Empire and the art styles within that empire. So let's go ahead and get started. We're going to look at a little bit of history of the Mughal Empire to understand the art that was created during this time period. So the Mughal Empire, not to be confused with the Mongol Empire, which is a completely separate empire, but on the same continent. But we're going to be looking at the Mughal Empire. The Mughal Empire is an early modern empire that's in South Asia. And it was around for about two centuries, depending on where you um, look at the start date of the empire. There is some um, you know, different opinions on when the empire officially began. So it basically stretched from the outer edges of the Indus Basin. So like the, think of like the Indus River, you know, Valley, like we study when we study ancient India, um, the Indus Basin in the West to what is Northern Afghanistan in the Northwest. Kashmir in the north, um, the highlands of present day Assam and Bangladesh in the east, and the uplands of the Deccan Plateau in what is now South India. So that's basically the geographical area that this um, empire and this kingdom um, controlled. Okay. So the Mughal Empire is said to have been founded in 1526. This is where it's a little interesting because some people say some other dates, but it's said to have been founded in 1526 by Babur, the warrior chieftain um, in what it, from what is modern day Uzbekistan. And he used weapons and techniques from the Ottoman Empire and he utilized those to defeat the Sultan of Delhi who was named Ibrahim Lodhi. Um, and he did this in the first battle of Panipat. And of course, you know, conquers him. He sweeps through to the plains of upper India, subdues the Rajputs and the Afghans and establishes the Mughal empire. All right, so the Mughal imperial, stru imperial structure um, however, with, you know, some historians is dated as beginning in 1600 rather than 1526. And um, they date it as beginning with the rule of Babur's grandson, Akbar. Okay, so this imp imperial structure lasted until about 1720, until shortly after the death of the last major emperor, Ar Aurangazeb. I don't know if I said that right. Hopefully I did. <laughs> um, Aurangazeb, during whose um, reign the empire also achieved its maximum geographical extent. So under his reign, they basically reached the extent of their geographical um, reach and it begins to fall after him during what is known as the East India Company, their rule over India, the empire begins to shrink um, to basically what is old Delhi around that area. And then the empire was formally dissolved um, by the British Raj after the Indian rebellion of 1857. So we have some of that like um, colonization that starts happening and you have the empire being overthrown. So that's why basically we say it existed for two centuries, roughly. Um, there is some debate on the exact start date of the Mughal empire, but for all intents and purposes, we'll just say it starts in 1526. So if we think about our art history, 1526, that's kind of like going into, um, you know, towards the end of like the Renaissance. So we think about at this time, um, a little before this time, we had Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo doing, you know, some of their major works of art, like the Mona Lisa and stuff. So if you think about time period, that's where it is chronologically. Um, it's kind of falling at that same time that we see like Leonardo da Vinci or shortly after, you know, producing some of his major works. All right. 
So contributions of the Mughal Empire, like I said, this is a brief history of the Mughal Empire because this is not history class, but as we study art history, we need to understand the histories of these um, people and groups that we study when we're studying their art. All right, so their contributions, they established a new administrative practice um, and incorporated diverse ruling elites. They developed a more efficient, centralized and standardized rule. And they created agricultural taxes that were instituted by the third um, Mughal emperor Akbar or Akbar that formed the base of the empire's collective wealth. And it forced artisans and um, cultivators which a lot of, uh, they refer to them as peasants, but it, it forced them to enter larger markets. Taxes were paid with a well-regulated silver currency. So they actually have a currency. They're not just trading goods, they have a currency that's been established. Mughal architecture. So Mughal architecture is a unique Indo-Islamic architectural style that develops in Northern and Central India under the patronage of the Mughal emperors from about 16th century to the 18th century, the time period of the Mughal empire. All right, so it is a remarkably symmetrical um, and decorative fusion of Persian, Turkish, and Indian architecture. The Mughals are also known for creating exquisite gardens that are in the Persian Sharbag um, layout, which is a quadrilateral garden divided by walkways and flowing water into four smaller parts. And these are based on the four gardens of paradise in the Quran. It is a very typical layout that you see in this part of the world, especially during this time, okay? So um, Mughal painting, let's look at this briefly, kind of an overview. Mughal painting is a style of South Asian miniature painting that developed in the courts of the Mughal emperors between the 16th and 19th centuries. It evolved from Persian miniature painting tradition with additional Hindu, Buddhist, and John influences. Mughal painting usually took the form of like book illustrations, like kind of think like the illuminated manuscripts um, or single sheets that are preserved in an album. There are four periods of Mughal art. And um, so as we look at this, Mughal art is divided into four periods and they're named for the emperors who commissioned the art in each subsequent period. So the first one we have is Akbar period, the Akbar period, obviously named for that emperor, just as all of these are. Then we have the Jahangir period, then we have the Shah Jahan period, and then we have the Aurangzeb period. Okay, so those are the four periods of Mughal art and architecture. All right, the Akbar period first developed during the reign of Akbar the Great, who lived from 1556 to 1605. He commissioned palaces, mosques, gardens, and mausoleums. Mausoleum is a tomb, and we'll see a little bit more about that later. The art and architecture was a synthesis of Persian, Turkic, Timurid, um, Iranian, Central Asian, and Indian, Hindu, and Muslim styles. So it's definitely a fusion. A lot of these periods are. Akbari architecture is the most, is um, considered to be most remarkable for its large scale use of sandstone which is evident in both the construction of the Fatehpur Sikri, Akbar's royal city, and Akbar's own tomb in Sikandra. The mosque at Fatehpur Sikri boasts the Buland Darwaza, which is the largest gateway of its kind in India. So early Mughal mosques had massive enclosed courtyards and domed shallow prayer halls. All right, so the tomb of Humayun. 
It is considered to be one of the finest accomplishments of Mughal architecture under Akbar. The tomb located in Delhi is that of his father Humayun, and it was commissioned in 1562 by Humayun's wife, Hamida Banu Begum, and designed by a Persian architect. It was the first garden tomb in, on the Indian subcontinent and the first structure to use red sandstone on such a large scale. It's also the first Indian building to use the Persian double dome, which you can see in these, um, in these images. And it has that outer layer that's supporting the white marble exterior, um, a material that wasn't seen in earlier Mughal architecture. And the inner layer gives shape to a cavernous interior um, that's really, it's just really open on the inside. The use of indigenous Rajasthani decorative elements in per is particularly striking, including the small canopies or shea trees, which are elevated domed um, kind of shaped pavilions that surround the central dome. It, a good way to kind of think of these, they kind of look like gazebos. If you know what a gazebo is, it kind of has that look. The Pietra Dura technique which means hard stone in Italian. It's a Florentine technique that we see used. Um, that technique with marble and even stone inlay ornamentation in geometrical and uh, um, arabesque patterns in the facade of the mo mausoleum and the jolly or latticed stone carving decoration um, is you know, utilized throughout this building. This style of decoration of the facade was an important addition to the Mughal architecture, and it flourished in later Mughal mausoleums, including the Taj Mahal, which we'll look at later. All right, so we can see here just some different details of the tomb of Humayun, and you can see those different patterns. You've got those different like geometric patterns and those influences of the Islamic art. Um, you even see like the six point star and the floor in some places. So you definitely see these influences of these fusion of cultures that come together. We have the Islamic influence in the architecture as well as some of the Hindu influences and some of the regional and indigenous um, materials being utilized as well. So you can kind of see some of those um, types of motifs and designs, um, a lot of natural designs, geometric, abstract. You don't see a lot of um, representation of people and humans. Most of what you see, which shows that influence of um, the Islamic world and so forth in this region is the fact that representations of people is absent and it's predominantly geometric or um, plants and natural, you know, things like that. All right, so we can kind of see those different materials, the red sandstone, we even see the white marble and so forth. So that's just kind of a glimpse at the tomb of Humayun, which is part of the Akbar period of Mughal art and architecture. All right, just a little overview of the Jahangir period. You can see some works of art from that period. Um, illustrating books assume secondary importance to portraiture during Jahangir's um, reign. And part of this was because of the emperor's own preference for portraits. So we see how emperor preference kind of plays a role in what's really commissioned and big during these different um, periods. Among the finest works of his reign are the elaborate court scenes depicting him surrounded by his courtiers. Um, their large scale exercise in portraiture and the likeness of each figure to pro is produced faithfully. In this style, the figures are more formally ordered, the colors are soft and harmonious, and the brushwork is particularly fine. Um, paintings definitely boast magnificent floral and geometric borders, which is another is a very cultural of this area and this time period and everything, all the influences there. It's really cool to see all of these fusions. And again, another fusion added 
deeply influenced by European painting due to the contact with the English crown. Um, and they received gifts of oil paintings from England. And so we see here yet another influence that's happening. So now not only do we have the, um, the Muslim and Islamic influence, we also have the Hindu influence. We have also added the European influence, predominantly that of the English um, influence because they're starting to explore other lands that are foreign to them. There's those trade routes that are being developed, those relationships that are being formed and so forth, okay? Um, and eventually after the fall of the Mughal Empire, we, we learned about this, you know, in our brief little history, they would be colonized by the English for, for a season, okay? So many of the works include plant and animal, including plant and animal studies, um, and they became part of lavishly finished albums. Most illuminated manuscripts were created by a single painter, okay? So that's just an overview of the Jahangir period, the Shah Jahan period. So we're gonna look at this and we are looking at the Taj Mahal. This is the pinnacle of Shah Jahan, the Shah Jahan period. Um, this is located in Agra, India. It is a white marble mausoleum. A mausoleum, again, is a, just a, some, simply a word for tomb. It's a very elaborate tomb. This is not, you know, just a gravestone. <laughs> um, this is a monument. And if you know about like with ancient Egypt and places like that, the pyramids are mausoleums. They are basically these grand structures that are built to house the tomb of someone's you know, famous or an emperor or pharaoh or, you know, someone like that. So a mausoleum is simply a very fancy place for your body to spend eternity. <laughs> um, so anyway, it is a white marble mausoleum. So it was built between 1632 and 1648 by Shah Jahan in memory of his third and favorite wife, Muntaz Mahal, constructed by 20,000 men, and it represents the Islamic Garden of Paradise and is widely regarded as the greatest achievement in all of Mughal architecture. So the, the whole two centuries that we have, the Mughal Empire, this is considered the greatest achievement of that entire empire. To learn more about the Taj Mahal, you can check out the podcast episode on this, on Art with Mrs. Cap. This is part of um, this unit. So make sure you check out that, that podcast and um, hear a little bit more. I didn't go into the full detail of Taj Mahal in this lesson because I have done it in our podcast episode. So make sure you check that out. All right, so just a few details of the Taj Mahal. If you see here, you can see here some of these images that show some details of the Taj Mahal. That aerial view, you can really see those walkways and the garden, that quadrilateral um, paradise focused garden that um, comes from, you know, teachings of the Quran. And you see that layout there that kind of represents the afterlife for um, Shah Jahan's belief system and everything there. So we see some of these designs and these motifs. Mughal motifs are very elaborate and beautiful and we see them a lot through the use of Pietra Dura, even painting, carving and some other things where they share those designs and those patterns even on the surfaces of their buildings. So we see that here with the Taj Mahal. So here are some details of the interior of the Taj Mahal. Again, we see these motifs, we see the use of Pietra Dura. We see all of these elements that are coming together and creating just this beautiful, elaborate structure. It's no wonder that the reason why this is like the capstone and the epitome of Mughal art and architectural accomplishment. This structure is breathtaking. 
So you can see a little bit more here. You see the way the light hits, you see those jolly screens, those carved screens and how the light creates patterns even through those and the use of those. So there's a lot of beauty in this structure. All right, now we're looking at the Aurangazeb and the late Mughal period, all right? So the emperor Aurangazeb, he lived from 1658 to 1707, and he did not encourage Mughal painting. So only a few portraits survived from his court because that wasn't a big focus for him. Most of the, the paintings of this period were not anything new. They basically accomplished the same cold and abstract style of his predecessor of um, Shah Jahan. The art form had gathered sufficient, you know, momentum to invite patronage in other courts like the Muslim, Hindu, and Sikh courts. And the absence of strong imperial backing ushered in a decline of the art form. So prior to Aurangazeb, these artisans were invited to other courts, just like with Renaissance art, we see Leonardo da Vinci, an Italian artist was invited to the French court where he, he finished his life out. Here we have these artisans of the Mughal empire were being invited to other courts to share their skill and their technique. It was so honored and revered, but we see that decline here with Aurangazeb. So we see that decline is kind of sad. But then we see a brief revival that occurred during the reign of Muhammad Shah, um, who lived from 1719 to 1748. And Mughal painting essentially came to an end during the reign of Shah Alam um, II from 1759 through 1806. So the artists of his disintegrated court contented themselves to basically copying masterpieces of the past. So there was no real innovation. They were just copying. They were basically copyist artists and they were just copying the masters of past periods rather than innovating and creating new styles that we've seen in these previous um, periods. All right, Mughal motifs. So what is a motif? When we use that word, what is a motif? A motif is essentially an element of pattern, image, it, you know, or part of one or more themes. It incorporates lines in various forms, such as horizontal, vertical, curved, diagonal, a design that consists of recurring shapes and colors, a theme that's elaborated on in a piece of unifying an idea or a recurrent element in a literary or artistic work. So it's something that can be repeated. Um, it's some form of design. And so a design is something that can begin with a motif and the repetition of a particular motif over surface area is called a pattern. So these are all of our vocab words that we've learned about before. Um, and the repetition of this pattern creates a design. So a design starts as a motif that then is repeated. That creates a pattern and that pattern creates a unified design. So that's simply what a motif is, is it is the repetition of it, you know, a motif is some type of design that we then take and we replicate to create a pattern which creates a unified design. Motifs used in the Indian Mughal Empire era can be classified into four different categories. They are the Islamic geometrical motifs, naturalized floral motifs, stylized floral motifs, and abstract motifs. So those are all the different styles of motifs that we see in this empire and during this time period. So Mughal motif category. So here's just the definition of what these different, these four different periods and styles of Mughal motifs are. So the Islamic geometric patterns are based on 
polygons such as hexagon and octagon and you connect to them and you end up with star polygons that appear and they're considered as a fundamental element of Islamic geometrical patterns. They create that six point star that we see a lot in these patterns. So that's just an idea of what these Islamic geometric patterns are. The natural motifs, as the name suggests, it comes from nature. So it includes flowers, leaves, vines, birds, animals that are embroidered on different garments, very close to natural designs. Stylized motifs, lose its natural form a little bit. So it's not like a true representation of nature. It's more stylized. So it loses that natural form and it becomes more decorative. So these motifs have more curves and details away from their natural form. So it's basically borrowing from nature, but creating a stylized example of that. Um, and they can look more complicated so those types of you know, motifs are called stylized motifs. Abstract motifs. These are only textures, veins, colors, patterns that are used to copy from natural species, but they're maybe not a figurative representation. They're non-figurative. So they borrow from those textures and those designs but it's not, you know, it's non-objective or it's non, um, you know, figurative. It is abstracted. So it's abstracted from nature or, you know, those kinds of things. So the Mughal era is known for its decorative art and its intricate perfection of designing and placement of motifs in these above styles. Um, this is what they use to embellish their textiles and their architecture. All right, so Mughal motif project. Taking what we've learned about Mughal designs and motifs and so forth for your project for this unit, you are going to use that information and you're going to create your own Mughal inspired motif using either paint or ink. You'll want to view the demo video and the assignment for more details, but this is just kind of a brief overview and introduction to what we're going to be doing for our project in this unit. I hope you enjoy today's lesson and I will see you in class. Bye.